Today on the CIO Podcast, we have Chief of Police, Christopher Cook from White Settlement Police Department in Texas. Thanks for being on the show. Man, I appreciate the invite. Um, it's kind of coming home for me. I've been on here before, as you know, and uh, excited to reconnect and just kind of share what's been going on. Yeah, welcome back, man. You were you were on the show all the way back in the beginning in April of 2021. You were episode number 14. So, you know, it, you were you were like, an, you're an OG. You're definitely an OG. <laughs> So, Chris, you have moved around a little bit since I believe we talked back then in 2021. So let's talk about your movement and so our listeners know where you are on front, where you come from and where you went to. Yeah, so I had a great career in Arlington, Texas. We're just down the road, about 30 minutes from here. A lot of people don't realize uh, this is actually my hometown. Uh, when you're the chief of a place called White Settlement, you better know how to work the public relations and the media relations and, and really, you know, rely on the relationships that I built in Arlington. Because as you can imagine, um, sometimes, you know, you do get questions. And while we have a Native American history out here, uh, people don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Right. And so um, for me, uh, I uh, promoted a deputy police chief in Arlington. Had a great run. I enjoyed every minute of it. They were really good to me. A great career over there. Uh, position opens up out here. We're a, kind of a military community. We have the Naval Air Station Joint Reserve Base Fort Worth and also Air Force Plant Number 4, which is building the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, Lockheed Martin is the current contractor out here. So, you know, it was kind of a no-brainer. I put in for the job. Wasn't sure I'd get it. But I think they uh, they had a little bit of pity on me since I was hometown kid here, went to school out here. And so been here right up about two years and a couple of months and, and really continue to do a lot of things from community engagement, public information officer kind of duties, all that. You know, the, the ongoing joke with all the police chiefs in Dallas, Fort Worth, they're like, we never even heard of that town till you got out there. And they said it really reaffirmed to us relationships with the media matter because now you're in the news all the time. And so, uh, yeah, just been having a lot of fun. And we've got a great team here, about 55 uh, personnel that's assigned to the department. So much smaller, uh, again, population around 20,000 or so, but super excited uh, to be here today. Outstanding. So Steve, the whole reason you're on the show today is as you approach me about this topic. So let's get into it. You wrote a book. It's called The Art of Strategic Communication. Why did you write it? Yeah, you know, real excited to, to be a guest here. You know, this has been a need, I think. And, and it's not so much in the public information officer realm. You know, as you know, you, you interview people all the time. We've got some great people out there that are doing phenomenal things. They know they can run circles around me. But really for me, in 2020, you recall the incident with George Floyd and really the, the country was reeling. I had the, uh, the fortunate, uh, I guess, invite, if you, for lack of a better word, to testify to the President's Commission. Uh, it was their community trust panel. And uh, my testimony, it's widely uh, out there. It's easy. People can Google it and see what I, what I spoke about. But in reality, it was all about making sure that we're connecting with communities, making sure we're telling our stories, especially when we have these critical incidents. And following that testimony, anybody that's ever testified, you know, you only get a few minutes. Like, you don't just get to, to rattle on. So you really have to make sure that you have good talking points. And so after that, Phil Keith was the cops office director at the time. His office had reached out and, and they were real excited about the testimony. And they said, hey, it really did. It was very positive. And, and they're like, you know, really what we're looking for is a guidebook. And out of that came several guidebooks, uh, several people you've interviewed on this podcast, Judy Powell, Anthony Gugliami, you know, Laurel McElroy, all of them kind of, we all kind of got together and we all kind of had a piece of this. A couple of the guidebooks have already been uh, produced, like the strategic uh, communication guidebook that was a partnership with DOJ, COPS office and major city chiefs. There was also a branding one that I was uh, able to participate in. We rewrote the Amber Alert uh, guidebook for police agencies because anytime you have a kidnapped child, that's a critical incident. You got to be, you got to get in front of that really quickly. And really, the last component of this was this guidebook, the Art of Strategic Communication. And, and, and I was able to really to put my hat on from the last, you know, 20 years or so. Being at Arlington, we had a wide range of critical incidents. Not every critical yep. incident uh, always has controversy, but. Really what it, uh, it telegraphed to me, especially following this testimony in 2020, most police departments and sheriff's departments in the United States, they're very small. They don't really usually have a dedicated spokesperson or a dedicated PIO or strategic communication advisor is kind of the new buzzword now. It's usually the sheriff, the chief, or, or, or somebody that, that gets you know, the finger pointed at saying, you're going to do this. And so 
Uh, that was really the reason I wrote the book. Because I'll be honest with you, when the cops office first reached out, I was like, I am in no condition to write a book. I don't have time. It sounds pretty hard. I, you know, where in the world? And, and then number two, why am I even qualified? Right. I mean, I'm just this guy in Arlington. Yeah, I'm doing a few things, but there's a lot of rock stars out there that are doing even better things than I'm doing. And so um, I really had to, to pray about it. And every time I turned around, uh, there was something about the book that was still there. And so I just put pen to paper um, and, and found a publisher that, uh, that they've worked with before. Uh, you might recall Eric Kowalczak uh, also produced a book uh, during his stay in Baltimore. And so um, it was really instrumental getting a good publishing team that could fix my Texas writing because I kind of write as I speak, which is always not the best grammar and, and all of that, right? And so they were able to actually uh, take what I wrote tweak it, uh, certainly distill it down to something that would be manageable, something that would fit into a quick guidebook. And the purpose of the book is just to tell our story. That is the, everybody asked me, what's the purpose? I was interviewed by some, uh, some media last week. It's to do a better job at telling our story. Because if we don't tell our yeah. story, nobody knows what we're doing. And certainly that sometimes also includes when we have big things that happen, we need to be in front of it. The book really goes into detail about that as well. So that's, that's kind of the true meaning of the entire project. Yeah, and, and going back to going back to the whole George Floyd uh, incident that occurred, and we, you you look back at that and you go, okay, uh, what what was the factors that really made that stand out as communications failure in the long run? And it was everybody's home. Nobody was there. They were all stuck at home watching this unfold, and and we didn't have any communication coming out of the police department at the time. And and unfortunately, you know, it is what it was. And, and this should have been a, me a message to a lot of organizations to get their ducks in a row. And they still lack in a lot of places, even where they have resources for staff. They, they just don't see the communications with the communications person or the PIO as that person that they need to turn to when, they, when these things unfold. And, and that leads me into my next question, which is in your first chapter. Why should leaders and advisors care about communication? Can you elaborate on it? Absolutely. You bring up a good point. And I know there's been a lot of deep dives on the Minneapolis uh, situation. John Elder, a good friend of mine that was uh, on their team at the time, they were in a really difficult situation, but you're exactly right. They did not have the facts uh, to be able to respond initially. And, and you know, that's why it took a couple of days. But by the time you're trying to respond, then the credibility has gone. And, and that really hurt all of our uh, noble profession. We've got so many police officers uh, that do a great job for our communities. And, and it was really detrimental uh, across the board. Really, as we talk about why it's important from a leadership uh, standpoint, you better get communications right. If not, you're going to have a very short tenure. Our police chiefs around the nation uh, are pretty much three to five years is, is kind of the the average, uh, if you look at a lot of the statistics that are out there, and if you look at you just Google police chief or fired, and, and you will be able to follow that usually chain of events, and it usually has some type of communication core to that. Either they were unable to communicate you know, with their officers or their staff, so maybe a vote of no confidence comes out, or they were unable to communicate when it mattered, when you have a controversial incident or something that was going on uh, that they were able, you know, they should have been able to manage it, but they just could not figure out the comm side. And that also uh, leads to people's demise. And so, and then the third thing why it's important, what happens in Vegas does not always stay in Vegas. I, I hate to break it to everyone. Like whatever happens on the East Coast can affect the West Coast. If we do something really poor here in our town, we could affect the whole profession because you're exactly right. It's not just the small agencies, mid-sized or large agencies. It can happen anywhere. We have seen time and time again, large agencies that have an entire team that they, they should be able to understand the stuff that struggle. I've seen small agencies that have no PIOs that have done well. I've also seen where they struggle from time to time. And so really hopefully uh, by putting that in the front part of the book, that's really the why. The first two chapters is all about the why does this matter to you? And why should you have a PIO? Even if you can't afford to pay somebody full time, maybe you have somebody that's already on your team that they become, that, that's an ancillary duty and why they should be a direct report to you as a leader, why they should be the extension of you. And you've got to invest in them. You've got to send them to training. You've got to make sure that they can network because there's no shame in raising your right hand saying, hey, I need some help. I've done that throughout my whole career. 
on some of the most uh, difficult cases I ever responded to in Arlington, where I've reached out to agencies across the country. And it's because of this network like that you provide here. It's because of the network that you achieve when you go to training conferences and getting to know people. And so that's really the why, and that's what the first two chapters are devoted to. Danny, so in chapter three, you talk about managing traditional media. How do we manage the media? I mean, yeah. sometimes they don't even make sense sometimes on themselves. And the, and the term media nowadays is so broad because it could be an internet blogger, it could be a podcaster for all we know nowadays. Yeah, it's really a misnomer because to be quite honest, you're never really going to manage the media. The media will do what the media does. Hopefully you have a good relationship and, and that your expectation is that when stories are conducted, that they're done in a fair manner that you are able. So, because once you get to the point where you have that positive rapport with media, it doesn't frighten me if it's a negative story, it's okay. I, I know that I'll work with them. I'll get them the facts they need. And I'll certainly try to position our agency in the best possible light. Sometimes that means we just have to acknowledge, Hey, we made a mistake. Um, this is what we're doing to prevent it from happening again. And this is the accountability piece uh, that goes along with that. So when I talk about managing the media, it's really more about the way you manage your organization as you interact with the media. Because many leaders will tell me, well, I don't do anything with the media. I don't like the media. I don't trust the media or whatever the case may be. That is the worst kind of opinion that you can have as a leader because that does not stop stories. No comment ever stopped a story. Very famous quote uh, from John Miller who now uh, works at CNN, retired from NYPD. Just because you stick your head in the sand and pretend like nothing's going on, that doesn't mean that things will, will not still uh, permeate and, and stories will run. And so from that chapter, and that's probably one of the longest chapters in the book, really we talk about getting out of your comfort zone, going to newsrooms, visiting them, forming the relationship, holding media mixers. You know, I, I really try to show the side of the media that, hey, they're not all that bad because they're really not. They have a job to do, and I would much rather live in the United States of America, where we have a free press, versus some communist country that controls the messaging and narrative. And so once I'm able to kind of change that paradigm and that mindset, uh, then the media will absolutely uh, be viewed as an ally versus a foe. Uh, a funny little sidebar, I got a, a text message, uh, actually it was a LinkedIn message, I don't even know uh, this individual. I'll, I'll withhold his name, but he's a reporter in Southern California. And on launch day, he sends me a message. Hey, bought the Kindle version. And he's like, holy moly, this is fantastic. I wish that people could see us as really what we are designed to do from a societal standpoint and just that we're telling stories. Not to say that there's, you know, every reporter is perfect or every reporter is good, just like not every officer always upholds their values or upholds their principles as well. But what the message he was trying to send is that so many times when he goes to an agency in Southern California, um, the, the law enforcement agency is just non-responsive or, or they just refuse to even you know, answer an email or answer the call or whatever the case may be. And so he really appreciated the way really that that chapter was presented because it really showcases, hey, in America, this is important. Because the stories are going to run, regardless of whether we participate or not. I don't know about you, Robert, but I would be much, I would rather be in an advantageous position where at least I'm giving our side of the story with the facts, whether that's video release, whatever, because then the story has more balance to it as we move forward. I agree. And, and a reporter here in Chicago that I'm friends with, Ben Bradley, years ago when I, I had introduced my daughter uh, to him as a part of a journalism thing, and he said, we're the mirrors of the world. That's our job is just to mirror what's going on in the world. And, and what better way to do it from the law enforcement and it is provide our story to them so that they can project it out to the, the community. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Chief. Let's talk about uh, a couple other things that you have in here. Uh, branding, reputation, and image management. Why, why is it so important to manage these issues? Yeah, you know, we're all going to stumble. You know, we hire human beings uh, in law enforcement. They're definitely fallible. I'm one of them. I've made many mistakes over my career. And so there are times where you're going to have officer misconduct. There are times you're going to respond to an incident and you don't manage it to the satisfaction of either the community or, you know, there's missteps along the way, which causes you to take a hit to your reputation. 
Um, I would challenge anybody that's watching the podcast, think about all the agencies around you. You probably have some agencies that you know that are very competent, very professional, and, and do the right thing. And then there's probably a few without naming names where you're like, well, you know, there's a little slippage there. Maybe they could do a little bit better job at telling their story. Because when we tell our story, if we're doing it the right way, we're going to add to that trust bank. The whole premise behind community engagement and media relations is to enhance trust. I mean, every police chief, every sheriff, every commissioner will tell you that. That's really the end game is to elevate trust. Well, the the whole deal with branding and reputation management, number one, we got to know what the community is saying about us. So you've got to monitor that. Number two, when there are people that are attacking our brand, and there will be, and some uh, have a legitimate uh, concern and gripe sometimes, and then there are others that just, you know, there, there's hatred out there. There's a lot of uh, misinformation that exists, especially on social media. But we have to be part of that conversation because that will affect our brand. And so that's why it's so important. I spent a lot of time talking about everything that you do from video uh, production to if you decide you're going to use a podcast. You know, we have a podcast here in our department. Anything that you're doing to build that brand, to reinforce your values, because everything that you do, your social media strategy, everything that you produce should orient themselves and align with your organizational goals and values. If they don't, then you need to probably check in uh, with your uh, strategic comms plan and decide, okay, how do we tweak that? Because, you know, you don't want to send uh, mixed signals. Too many times we have a controversial incident, and a lot of times it does have to do with force, and our brands take a hit. And so if we're not really dialed in and, and pushing the edge of the envelope to make sure that we're producing great content to build that trust, then when you take that trust withdrawal, you got to make sure there's still something in the bank there, right? And so that's why I spent a lot of time in the book just talking about that. And, and there is some great people across the profession from coast to coast that are doing phenomenal things that enhance reputational management, that are really building uh, an army, I call it an army of advocates for your police uh, agency. That's really when you, you know you're really hitting on all cylinders when everyone on social media is taken up for your brand whenever someone's trying to take a shot at you. And that's so, that you, br you brought the word, the phrase trust bank, and I've always used that. And when you build into that trust bank year after year and you're consistent, the community will come and defend you when you make mistakes. As long as you're honest with them and forthright, that trust bank goes, will always come forward for you as long as you have built it prior to that incident. So absolutely. Steve, I want to jump over and talk about visual and audio storytelling. I want to talk about winning narrative, I'm sorry, navigating crisis and critical incidents. I think that's such a thing right now. I just saw an article out of Ontario where a police department had a critical incident use of force that was used against someone. And they said that they don't have the ability to redact video. And so they're not going to release the video. That's not a really good response to having a critical incident. No, I think people will see through that. I'm not sure of the, the case you're speaking about, but but let's just face it. We, we even had a similar uh, incident uh, in our region where uh, the video was very slow to come out. And it was like a death of a thousand cuts uh, for the whole profession in North Texas. Because when you're slow to release, and I get it. Look, I'm not advocating you release video prematurely. Uh, before we have statements in, and I, and I certainly don't want to derail uh, the criminal or administrative investigation, but the longer that you sit on it, the more uh, hit that you're going to take to your trust bank, because people will make the assumption, some, not all, that there's something there, right, that we don't want out, or you're hiding something, or, you know, you've got this public relations kind of spin, which is really a, a negative kind of aspect uh, to allege against our agencies. And so, when, you know, as I kind of talk about critical incidents, because we're going to all have them. And again, not every critical incident always has controversy. Some do, some do not. But there's an information zone in there. I call it the danger zone. From the time that the officers get on scene, figure out what's going on before we brief the community, brief the media, there's a vacuum there that everybody else is going to fill that information void, right? Sometimes you have people that claim to be experts. And we know time and time again, a lot of community people want their five minutes of fame and they'll make stuff up saying that they saw the officer do this or that, or, or yep. they saw this incident unfold this way, when in reality, they weren't even there, right? And so it's really important to try to get ahead of that. Almost every critical incident follows the same trajectory. Once you can brief the media and the community and then reaffirm that, 
at some point and then get in front of things if video does need to come out, then you are really, you're never fully controlling the narrative, but you're in a much better position because you are able to fall back on that you're the official source of information. And, and this is the official statement. Now you got to be right. You can't put out misinformation yourself. And, and I know sometimes we make mistakes and, and I love how Judy Powell always says narratives are like concrete. Once they are kind of out there, they're really hard to change. And so, uh, God forbid, you know, when a law enforcement agency puts out something that's not correct, then you got to correct it, right? There's again, there's a hit there uh, because people are like, you're professional. How how could you not have the correct information? I'll give you another example uh, that I just saw, and I won't name the agency. It was very recent. There was an officer involved shooting, and the reporter asked the question of the PIO, and I felt so bad. They said, hey, did you watch the video, the body-worn camera fit, uh, footage? Because you could tell the PIO was struggling a little bit on, on exactly explaining what happened. And she actually said no. And I, you know, I about fell out of my chair because like we've been trying to talk about this for years that never, mm -hmm. ever give a statement, especially an officer involved shooting, if you have not reviewed that footage. You have to because what happens if the footage is not good, right? What happens if you're not on the high ground after you watch the video, but then you've just given this, this fact set that ends up having to change. And so it's really important. We talk about that in that, in those chapters there about critical incident management. There's also some checklists, you know, that we did with PERF uh, years ago. And so really trying to help out because your small agencies, keep in mind, they're not dealing with a lot of these critical incidents or crises on a frequent basis. So it's a good way they can flip to that chapter uh, and, and kind of, you know, eyeball, these are some things to be thinking about when they're dealing with those types of situations. So Steve, what is the importance of um, visual and audio storytelling just in, in the day-to-day -day operation of the police department? It Storytelling, that's it. If we don't tell our story, people don't know what we did. You know, I, I know I get a lot of chiefs that, that say, man, every time y'all have a community event, you are really putting a lot of stuff out. Don't they know you already have this program? And, and I'm, my response is always, I'm always reaching somebody. Videos do very well. And the reason they do, a matter of fact, that's where media will even grab your stuff when you put it out, right? And so videos, you're able to tell a large story. And, the, and, and it's gotten so easy. I mean, now with our, our, everybody's got cell phones. You don't even need the fancy cameras. You can literally get a microphone for like 100 bucks at B&H Photo. And then you have professional audio uh, to go along with it. It's easy to edit. I edit everything on the iPad. I have an iPad Pro. And, and I mean, I'm done uh, quick. And so that's really uh, what... Uh, is in it for us. We even do a, a, a show called On the Job. I do it monthly where all I do is just talk about the cops. Everything that the cops, our dispatchers, our professional staff team members are doing uh, and people love it. We have another one called WSPD TV because we're not real original in our names and we take body wall and camera footage and, and dash camera footage and we tell the story. So that's on the video side. The audio side has been really interesting. I was one of these guys that didn't really listen to a lot of podcasts uh, in the past. When I came to White Settlement, I think it's because we're a military community. We have a huge uh, podcast community out here. And so um, I started, you know, figuring out how to do it. A good friend of mine, Daniel says, he's the chief in Grand Prairie, uh, had told me that they've seen a lot of success with their podcast. And, and so, you know, next thing I know, I'm talking to Buzzsprout. I got a hosting service, got a little, a little uh, sound a mixer or whatever uh, to record it. And then, bam. We're netting sometimes uh, multiple thousands of views, more views on a podcast than I am on videos, right, uh, on YouTube. And so it's, it's been really good. And that's and, and here's the, the takeaway. A lot of people that I run into community events, they'll say, hey, I love your podcast. I love the WSPD briefing room. Uh, and I always say, OK, thank you, first of all, for giving me that positive feedback. But number two, do you follow us on Facebook? Do you follow us on X or Twitter? Do you follow us on? No, no, no. So I'm reaching a demographic that I normally would not be reaching if I was not in the podcast. It perfectly sums that up. That's, God, we're always trying to find people to reach. So you're, you're actually verifying that those are new. That's awesome. Steve, let's talk about winning narratives and sound bites. Yeah, so um, this goes back to uh, my new hometown here. When the Chiefs are saying, how in the world does white settlement always get in the news? They're in the news more sometimes than Fort Worth or Dallas, right? It's not really true, but... But that's what they say. And, and I really go back to winning narratives, writing a news release that's going to be picked up. What I mean by that is I call it the perfect pitch. 
if you really want news coverage, let's say, I'll give you an example. We were moving to Western style hats. Every media across the country has done that story before where cops get, you know, cowboy, cowgirl hats and all that, right? But I really wanted some footage out there with the community. And so I sent out a news release. I already filmed a bunch of B-roll footage because, uh, you know, everybody that's listening to your show knows what B-roll is. So I gave the media a reason to say yes. Like, here's the footage of the officers picking up their hats. Here's the footage of the actual store shaping uh, the brims of the hats. And then not only did I do that, I called the news desk and I said, hey, did you see my news release? Because let's face it, I'm in the fifth largest media market. There's a lot of news releases flying around there daily. Yep. And so, um, you know, I don't know if the media just feel sorry for me because they're always like, yes, Chris, we got your news release. I said, OK, well, are you coming out to cover it? Because I would love for you to come out. And so I try to make it easy. That's just an example. I can give you time and time again, though. It's not always feel good. Sometimes, you know, we had a bunch of Kias that were being stolen. You know, this deal where you can uh, plug in an iPhone cord and steal a Kia or a Hyundai. Well, I found a victim that was upset and she and I knew the media would love this if I could get a victim to go on camera. So I put that in my news release. Hey, here's the victim. She's willing to speak. That's an example of a winning narrative to where you're going to really get you're going to maximize your chances to get coverage now you also got to play the the news cycle game and, and it talks about that in the book about there are some days that are better than others than to send out a news release i'll give you an example if i already know that fort worth's got a big press event on the police side of the house on a monday then i'm probably going to wait right i don't want to compete with fort worth i don't want to compete with arlington i don't want to compete with some of the other uh, jurisdictions in my area so it's really about networking with your other peer police chiefs and sheriffs uh, seeing what's going on before you try to launch something. And a lot of times the media will tell you that, you know, that's why you got to call them and say, Hey, I'm thinking about this news release. What do you think? Do you think it's something you might be interested in and they can help you. And then just maximizing that soundbite. It's crazy. But in the 1960s, the average soundbite, this is going way back. By the way, I wasn't born until 74. I'd read this in a book somewhere, but in the 1960s, it said it was 40 seconds, meaning that if you gave a news story in 1960, you'd get about 40 seconds. The average soundbite in 2023 last year was about six seconds. That's crazy. I mean, that explains why, you know, PIOs and chiefs get frustrated. They're like, hey, I gave a two minute interview with the media and literally four, five, six seconds of what I said aired. Yeah. And so you got to master, you got to dial in on the sound bites. You got to make sure your key messages are there. And so we talked about that in the book. Websites are, are always a concern. Why is it so important to have an updated, accurate website? Yeah, number one, if you have a static website, and I, I had that in Arlington, and, and I didn't know any better, but then the first time I visit your website, okay, cool. The second time, maybe two or three weeks later, maybe it's kind of cool. The third time, if nothing's changed, I'm probably not coming back. So you really got to make sure that you're putting out your news releases. You got to put... Also, don't be bashful. What is If something's doing great on social media, put that in your news corner on your website. Make sure like your annual reports, you know, we do an annual report to council. Make sure that stuff's on there. Our strategic plan is on there because if we really get down to the, the, the bottom line, we always like to believe that our community is the part of the public safety team. And so if you're going to involve your community to be crime fighters, report suspicious things, partner with you, again, building trust, right? Then make sure you have a responsive website where they can go and figure out what your programs are, how to connect with you. Make sure your calendar's up to date on, on community events because quite frankly, you know, I love, I mean, I love to imagine that every time I put a Facebook post up, everyone sees it. But, but I already know that's not true. I don't control <laughs> Facebook's algorithm. Secondly, it, there's no young people on Facebook. So they're not seeing it all, at all. That's why we're kind of on Instagram and looking at some other options as well, because we want to reach all of the demographic across our community. And so your website, though, can help you. It's kind of that it's really the foundation for your social media, the foundation for your news advisories and all of that. And so keep your websites up to date. If you don't know how to do it, most of them are WordPress based. From what I can tell from a government perspective, WordPress is super simple to operate. As a matter of fact, I've been seeing some PIOs offer some courses on that uh, or find somebody in your city that you can send the content up to get it updated. Is it important that people buy your book? 
Yeah, um, number one is obviously Amazon. Uh, that's where, uh, if you go to Amazon.com, you can either search me by name as an author or the art of strategic communication. You can also go to policepio.com or sheriffpio.com, uh, and then you, it'll it'll link into Amazon. It's also technically uh, online, like at Barnes and Noble, other online booksellers as well, thrift books. Uh, but I think Amazon uh, prints it really fast uh, when you get an order. I would also challenge your audience if they're going to the National Information Officers Association conference in August. We actually have a class on the book and uh, people will get free copies there of the book if they didn't want to spend the money on it. Secondly, if they come to IACP, it's in Boston in October, come to the PIO section. There will also be a class there. Um, we'll have copies there as well. Uh, but but yeah, I really appreciate the support. Certainly, I've already gotten a lot of good feedback. Uh, I also found out there's a comma that's misplaced somewhere in there, chapter three. And so we'll, we'll get that fixed <laughs> on the next printing. No matter how many eyes, uh, you know, uh, review something, you always have a, a mismatch typo or a grammar issue somewhere. You know, if, if there's not something in there that's got a, an error, I mean, we know somebody's going to find it, right? I mean, it's, it's horrible. All right, Chief, let's change this up. Rapid fire questions, all right? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Texting or talking? I'm usually a texter. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla for sure. Coffee, tea? It's got to be Kona coffee. Adult drink of choice? Probably Dr. Pepper. I am laying off the alcohol. Uh, a superpower, if you could have one, what would it be? I'd love to be a mind reader. I think that would help my agency out. <laughs> Ask permission or beg for forgiveness? I usually beg for forgiveness because that allows me to be uh, intuitive and uh, and get things done. Place you'd most want to travel to? Uh, it's got to be Hawaii three times a year is where we go. Outstanding. If you could have coffee with any living or dead historical figure, who would it be? Probably be President Ronald Reagan. I uh, really think that... Uh, he was able to unite the country. Thank you. Chris, final thoughts. What key points will our listeners get out of your book if they buy it? Yeah, you know, number one, it's a great resource guide. Uh, sometimes when we're in the thick of things, when things are really bad, let's say we have an internal issue, um, you know, it's nice to have a reference just to kind of go and, and, and try to thumb through that and, and find just some advice. Another thing, and I think this has been out of all the feedback I've received, and this book has already been sent to 2,700 police chiefs in Texas. They love the first couple of chapters where, I think it's chapter one, we talk about the ACE principle. Um, they're like, hey, I don't even need to read the book any further. What the ACE principle is, is, is A stands for assess the situation. So let's say you got a media inquiry that comes your way. You assess it, right? The C stands for choose a path or plan. And then the E is you execute. You got to do what you say you're going to do. And then we always have time to evaluate typically. Um, so if we need to retweak it. So I think there's a lot to get out of the book. Hopefully, again, uh, this is not about egos or anything like that. You certainly don't make any money off really selling books. It's really about uh, bettering our profession. And uh, again, a lot of great work out there. And so I appreciate the feedback and support. Thank you, Steve. And how can people actually talk to you if they want to connect or follow up? Yeah, LinkedIn is a great way. Um, it's just LinkedIn, uh, Christopher Cook. You can find me there pretty easy. Or if you go to policepio.com, uh, you can uh, send me a message there, uh, chief at policepio.com as well. And really I will add that and the link to your Amazon, to your book on Amazon. So in the show notes, so that the listeners can find it if they want to purchase it. All right. Appreciate it, Robert. Thank you so much. Chris, thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, good luck with the book sale. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate you.